be God who forgives all our sins, God's, God's mercy endures forever. Almighty God, to you, you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us now confess our sins against God and neighbor. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. <laughs> Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison. May God be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Give ear to our words, O Lord, and direct the way of your servants in safety under your protection, that amid all the changes of our earthly pilgrimage, we may be guarded by your mighty aid. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us now stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but a salt has lost its taste. How can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under the bushel basket but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works, and give glory to God your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. 
I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, tonight we are, uh, we don't usually get to uh, commemorate some of the saints that we normally commemorate uh, in our, in the All Saints book by uh, Robert Ellsberg, because during Lent we usually have a variety of different preachers who are helping out. Uh, and they're all preaching about their own particular things. And so a lot of the saints that we would normally cover during this time, we don't get to cover. Well, guess what? We don't have those guest preachers during Lent because of COVID. So we get to hear some of those saints tonight. And to read about our particular saint tonight, I'm going to use the brand new glasses that Deacon John just gave me. These are my Jeffrey Dahmer glasses. Uh, they look like Jeffrey Dahmer's glasses. And uh, what was it, a few weeks ago, uh, Deacon John was wearing glasses very similar to this. Two pair. Wonderful. And I said to him, hey, you look like Jeffrey Dahmer in those glasses. And so this is his little revenge on me. So he got me some Jeffrey Dahmer readers. They're bifocals, which I've never had before. So I'm going to see if I can read about our particular saint tonight with my bifocals. And it's not going so well. So I might be messing this up horribly. I had these same glasses when I was a teenager in high school back in the 80s. So uh Actually, it feels kind of weird wearing them. So um, we're going to hear we're going to hear about our saint tonight. He's uh, none other than uh, great. Sandy Holbrook's here, and she's laughing so hard over these glasses. It's it's very hard to concentrate on our saint tonight, Sandy. So uh, yes, put your mask on, Sandy, so I don't have to see your reaction to my glasses. Um, I, I'm going to get cat eyes next week. So cat eye glasses, you know. Think 1963, yes. Uh, the, the saint we're going to commemorate tonight is none other than Carl Rahner. We love Carl Rahner. Uh, if you don't know anything about Carl Rahner, uh, I, you don't call yourself a liberal in the Christian church. But Carl Rahner is a very important liberal theologian. He was a Roman Catholic. And we're going to hear a little bit, uh, well, quite a bit about Carl Rahner tonight, if I can actually see how I'm going to do this. Uh, he was a theologian, of course, born in 1904, died in 1984. And the quote comes from him. I'm going to see if I can't read it without these. No, you know what? I can't. All right. The real, and total, uh, the real and total and comprehensive task of a Christian is to be a human being, a human being, of course, whose depths are divine. To this extent, Christian life is the acceptance of human existence as such. Karl Rahner was the foremost Catholic theologian of the 20th century. His life passed externally in a fairly monotonous course of teaching and writing. But in his quiet and methodical way, he did more than any other theologian to overcome the gulf between Catholic theology and the critical reason of the Enlightenment. His chief aim was to make Christian faith intelligible to human beings living in the modern world, a situation characterized by doubt, pluralism, science, and historical consciousness. Most, but not all of his works were addressed to a theological audience but he was never motivated by purely intellectual interests. He remained, first of all, a priest concerned with the pastoral needs of the Christian people and the importance of dialogue with all people of, uh, with all people of goodwill. Now, that sounds wonderful. That sounds beautiful. That sounds so noble. We think, isn't that the ideal? That is the ideal that we want in a theologian, right? Well, we forget one thing. He was a Roman Catholic priest in all of this. And guess what? They didn't like that. He was a little bit of a, a, a rebel, shall we say. Uh, and he would be absolutely appalled to be called a rebel. He was just a good professor. He, he was a good theologian. He was a loyal priest. He was just doing his methodical 
predictable world and his life and his, uh, his intellectual pursuits. But guess what? What came out of that uh, were things that threatened a lot of people in the church. And we're going to hear a little bit about that. Uh, Ronner was born on March 5th, 1904 in Freiburg, Germany, to a traditional Catholic family. His older brother Hugo entered the Jesuits in 1918, and Carl followed three years later. Well, we know that. If he's entering the Jesuits, we know that he's not going to live a normal life. He's going to probably be a bit of a rebel. Those Jesuits, they, they were rebels all along. That, we, we kind of read a lot of Jesuits here, and there's a reason why. They, we would, I think if this was, I know we have a, a window to St. Benedict and St. Scholastic here, but I think if this was going to be a, a parish of any particular religious order, we'd probably be a Jesuit order here. They, they have Jesuit priests here if we were a Roman Catholic church. But uh, Francis is a Jesuit, Pope Francis. Yes, he is. Pope Francis is a Jesuit as well. Um, so he followed, he joined the Jesuits. He was ordained in 1932 and was sent to the University of Freiburg to study philosophy. There he found the professor of, in Catholic, theology, uh, Catholic philosophy to be a fairly narrow-minded champion of neo-Thomism. Now, neo-Thomism, of course, it was a big thing that was going on in the Roman Church at that time. Uh, they were following, of course, the teachings, the very, uh, very ardent teachings of uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, who was kind of the theologian par excellence in the Roman Catholic Church, especially mid 20th century. Uh, very traditional uh, theology when we really look at it. I actually, I, I don't have really a whole lot of issues with Thomism for the most part. I actually highly respect St. Thomas Aquinas and his, his theology and his philosophy. But what we're gonna see here is there's a conflict to some extent between Neo-Thomism, which was, um, uh, this this brand of philosophy and theology that was really going through the Roman Catholic Church at that time in which they were saying this is the only way of thinking about things and what poor Karl Rahner eventually would, would come across. Anyway, so uh, Rahner had some issues with his professor at the University of Freiburg. Uh, uh, Rahner found it more interesting to attend the seminars of none other than a Protestant Martin Heidegger. Heidegger was a huge liberal Protestant at the time. He was a Protestant, wasn't he? He was Lutheran, wasn't he? Yeah, Heidegger. I think, I think so. Uh, and Heidegger was a major liberal. He was one of the liberal Protestant uh, uh, theologians of that time and was, uh, I'm sure that caused some problems. From this exposure, he conceived of the possibility of reconciling the thought of Thomas, uh, Thomas Aquinas with modern philosophy, in particular, the transcendental uh, philosophy of another Protestant by the name of Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant, of course, was a major liberal as well, and a major theologian. Uh, and it's kind of interesting that a Roman Catholic of this time would have found Immanuel Kant so compelling. Uh, but anyway, Kant had signaled the famous turn of the subject in modern philosophy. He was interested in exploring the a priori or transcendental conditions within the human subject that enabled us to know something. Rahner went further to explore these conditions in the human subject, which make it possible to, rec to receive divine revelation. For Rahner, it was not sufficient to study dogma or the content of revelation in purely objective fashion. It was necessary to understand the relationship between this content and the subjective condition of human existence that make a person open to revelation in the first place. He called this method of theology transcendental anthropology. Now I know that's, that was a lot of heavy words for people who maybe haven't studied these things, but what he was talking about more than anything else was he was trying to bridge these more intellectual aspects of philosophy with something practical, something in the world, something spiritual in our lives. That it wasn't enough that we just read about these things in a book. We had to apply them to our spiritual lives in some way and to, to make them live in the real world to some extent. Because anybody who's ever studied uh, any of these things, it becomes very easy sometimes to just kind of get caught up in the book learning and, and the, uh, the the systematic aspect of studying and not always apply it to the real world. Uh, and it would have been very hard. And we have to remember when Rahner was doing all of this, it was what, 1930s Germany. Guess that, what else was going on in 1930s Germany? Nazism was on the rise. All of these things would have been very uh, uh, 
controversial even in that particular environment. So he, uh, he called this method of theology transcendental anthropology. Rahner's principal genre was the essay, and his most substantial work is contained in more than 20 volumes of his collected theological investigations. The range of his concerns covered nearly every topic in theology and is thus not easily summarized. But Rahner was an unusually systematic thinker. Nearly any point of entry into his work affords a glimpse of his entire vision. Now, one of his most uh, important books, and a book that if you have not ever encountered it, is something to encounter. Uh, I don't know if I'm recommending it to everybody, but if you're interested in Rahner, one of the books that I would always recommend is his kind of his 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 piece de resistance, shall we say, his uh, his ethics, the book ethics. It's an incredible book. Uh, I I find it very very appealing, and uh, we might talk about this a little bit more later on. But anyway, uh, in essence, Rana believed that all of human existence is rooted in the holy and infinite mystery of God. Religious experience is thus not a separate category of our existence. It is the potential for a certain quality or depth available in our everyday life. Grace, which is the self-communication of God, is not something utterly extrinsic to our human nature. Rather, human nature is supernaturally ordained in such a way as to be open to receiving this communication. So grace is not just something God does. It is something we and God do together, which is Pretty incredible when you really think about that. At the heart of the human being is a, uh, uh, is a driving force, is, is a force driving us toward union with an infinite horizon that lies beyond the objects of our knowing or loving. That infinite horizon is God, a holy mystery who is forever reaching out to us in every situation of our lives. So, it's easy to externalize all of these things. It's easy, even if we were going to talk about systematic theology, to say God is that horizon, that, that mystery that is beyond us out there, which was what a lot of the theology was doing at that time. There was a big gap between us and this mystery that is God. Rahner was saying, yes, that's true, but that, that horizon is reaching out to us as well. That is the essence of true Christian theology to some extent. That it's not just us living here in our world and God is like this watchmaker God who just kind of created everything and let everything go and remains a mystery. There is a reaching out and our job is also to reach out to that horizon. There needs to be a coming together to some extent, which I just love. I, I'm, that stuff just fascinates me. From his earliest writings in the uh, 1950s, Rahner showed his determination to liberate Catholic theology from the stultifying cons constraints of neo-scholasticism. Neo so um, to really understand what was going on in the Roman Catholic Church at that time, we have to understand that they were scared of anything that sniffed of liberalism. They hated liberalism, especially during this time. I know it's so different now. Um, but uh, at that time, they were really having an issue with, with uh, a lot. They were rebelling against a lot of the liberal theology that was happening elsewhere in the world. So what they did was they, they kind of pulled in the, the, the restraints. And a theology in the Roman Catholic Church was just very square and very uh, stiltified. And you just did this very systematic way. And you really didn't question things. That was the important thing. You didn't question theology in the Roman Catholic Church at that time. You let the priests or the professors teach you if you were studying to become a priest. And you just kind of did what you were going to do. And that is then what you took with you once you were ordained into the parish. And then you essentially preached that from the pulpits. And, you know, it, I guess it sort of worked to some extent, but there wasn't a lot of growth in that. And as we know, we as human beings do grow and we do expand and our, our intellectual capacities go beyond those things. And that would have been and it would have been fine in the Catholic Church during this time, the 40s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, that would have been fine because that was the way it was. But something big was about to happen in the Roman Catholic Church that was going to sweep that all away. None other than in the person of 
Pope John the Twenty Third, who became Pope in 1958 after Pope Pius the Twelfth died, and guess what he did? He started the he did the convocation of the Second Vatican Council in 1962. What does that mean? I am opening the the windows of the church and allowing the breath of the Holy Spirit to come through. Essentially. John the 23rd was sweeping all of that stiltified neo-scholasticism aside and was bringing forward a new kind of thinking. And who did he look to? Karl Rahner. Uh, Pope, uh, Pope John the 23rd personally named uh, Rahner as, the theo as a, a theological expert to the council. He went on to serve on commissions that drafted the vital documents on Revelation, the church, and the church in the modern world. Many theologians and bishops played a role in this vital council of reform and renewal. There is no doubt, however, that Rahner's influence was felt in almost every contribution to the council. Rahner was essential to the Second Vatican Council in so many ways, and uh, it was, it's, it was a, an amazing time. And what I don't think they're really touching on here is that Rahner also, before this, before 1962, especially in the 50s and the 40s, had received a lot of criticism for what he was doing. It, uh, the church did not like what, what Rahner was putting forward. It was controversial. All of a sudden, Rahner was essentially justified by the Second Vatican Council and Pope John XXIII. Rahner believed the council marked the arrival of a new era in Christianity, the beginning of a genuinely world church. And yet, he often felt discouraged over developments that seemed, in his view, to violate the spirit of the council. Invariably, with, when faced with disappointments, he spoke wistfully of the future and, and, uh, and his ultimate confidence in the Holy Spirit. Now, some of the things he had issues with were, uh, you know, there were things that he saw went a little too far. He was not happy with the liturgy, with the, a lot of the reforms in the liturgy. Uh, that was one thing he really had some issues with. Some of us still have some issues with some of the reforms in the liturgy, um, but th there were other issues that he had. But for the most part, he, he trusted in the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit knew what it was doing. By the end of his life, Rahner had become the most widely read and respected theologian in the church. His influence extended by, more vast, by the vast numbers of his students and his own efforts to write in a more popular vein. Although he remained the consummate church theologian, he continued to invite criticism from conservatives for reducing theology to anthropology and for erasing the boundaries between the church and non-believers. So what that's saying is essentially, uh, theologians kind of wanted to keep theology in this nice little safe academic world. And Rahner, what made him popular was he was taking theology and bringing it to the masses. He was bringing it to how do we live out theology in the world? That, that was controversial still at that time. And a lot of people were feeling that an academic should not be doing those kind of things theologically. Far more numerous were the number of those who credited Rahner with deepening or even preserving their faith. His own self-assessment was characteristically modest. I did not know what's happened to my life, he said. I did not lead a life. I worked wrote, taught, tried to do my duty and earn my living. I tried in this very ordinary, everyday way to serve God. That's it. That is how he saw his life. How beautifully simple that was. Uh, Rahner died on March 30th, 1984 at the age of 80. He was a great, great man. Uh, we, we love Karl uh, Rahner in so many ways. Um, but what we're seeing now in the Roman Catholic Church and uh, maybe elsewhere too, uh, this conservative strain that's running through the Roman Catholic Church, of course, are trying to undo some of the things that happened at the Second Vatican Council, including the influence of Karl Rahner. He's still a threat to uh, a major and very, uh, very important and uh, powerful strain in the Roman Catholic Church. And what we see is that Rahner has been kind of pushed to the side. He doesn't, people don't talk about Rahner like they used to talk about him uh, in the Roman Catholic circles. And that is really unfortunate. Um, I, and I, I just recently heard a story about a, uh, a conservative parish, a Roman Catholic parish, that uh, they had brought in Latin mass, the Latin mass, this particular parish, 
and I believe it was like in West Virginia or someplace like that, a bunch of people left, and the priest and the deacon and a couple of other people went through the library and cleared out all the theologians that they felt were not orthodox theologians. They were including Thomas Merton in this group, Henry Nowlin, uh, and Carl Rahner. And they, uh, Hans Kung, Hans Kung definitely was one of them, <laughs> and burned them. They burned the books. And it was uh. very frightening to hear such horrible things. Um, and you do see this almost like a neo-neotomism coming back into into play in in the church and i don't understand any of that i don't it it just boggles my mind i'm worried they're gonna throw jesus out uh well <laughs> not when you can coerce and make your jesus into a plastic facsimile of yourself <laughs> which is what we see happening a lot uh, can you tell them a bit bitter about those kind oh, of God. things making jesus into an idol is a huge thing for me right now in in my own personal theology and i Having lots of issues with that, but and Carl Rahner would have major issues with that. So I, I, I feel justified to some extent. Uh, my feeling about Carl Rahner is I don't see why he was so controversial. If you read his work, there's nothing controversial in it. He was an orthodox theologian through and through, but because he tried to reach out to the whole world, he didn't only see himself as a Christian, he saw himself as a human in the world and tried to reach out to other humans in the world. Uh, that would have, that was considered too controversial to a, a strain of, of Christian thinking, which is unfortunate. We're gonna close tonight with a prayer for Carl Rahner. So let us pray. Almighty God, you gave to your servant Carl Rahner special gifts of grace to understand and teach the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. Grant that by this teaching, we may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us now stand and profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In this Lenten season, let us offer prayers to the God of all comfort and forgiveness, saying, Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. For this holy gathering, for St. Stephen's, for those present, and for those unable to worship with us at this time, and for God and for all of us in every place, God of compassion, hear, hear our prayer. For an outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this congregation, that we may grow in holiness and vitality, God of compassion, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For all peoples and their leaders, for Joe, our president, and for our nation, and its leaders, and for justice, mercy, and peace in the world, God of compassion, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For peace in this world, for prisoners and refugees, God of compassion, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For all the sick, for all victims of pandemics across the world, and for those who suffer, for those who are dying, and for all in need of prayer, especially this evening, we pray for Josh, Annette, Deanna, Bill, Dan, Kirsten, Sandy Holden. God of compassion, hear our prayer. 
for all of those in special need. Tonight especially we remember the Morlock family, Jonathan, Bruce, and the Holden family. God of compassion, hear our prayer. For our own prayers, repeated either silent or aloud. God of compassion, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. For those who have died, especially this evening, we pray for Sharon Morlock and Greg Hansen. God of compassion, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lifting our voices with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Stephen the Martyr, and all creation, let us offer ourselves and one another to you, the living God, through Christ our Redeemer, God of compassion. Hear our prayer. God of our pilgrimage, we have found the living water. Refresh and sustain us as we go forth on our journey in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. May the peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you. Peace, peace. Peace to everyone. Please be seated. Just a few announcements before we uh, continue with our service. Uh, let's see, what is going on? Well, how's your class going on Thursday night, Deacon? It's very enjoyable. Very yeah. enjoyable. It's a very stimulating discussion. Uh, the, uh, the texts we're using are just wonderful um, charged texts. Very good. Uh, the born again text from John. The woman at the well, uh, really digging in and having just some really good conversations. So. Very good. Two more classes left, one tomorrow night and then one next Thursday. If you're interested in learning more, contact Deacon John. Yes, they could, people still can join in. And sure can. Like the more. classes aren't uh, connected. Right. So you can take them individually or so. Wonderful. Speaking of classes, uh, I, you mentioned, oh, I saw a little, I put a little something in the newsletter about this, but uh, following Easter, uh, not the first week after Easter, but the week after that on Thursday nights, we'll be doing a rosary class here at St. Stephen's. I know Sandy is excited about that. She's been waiting for that for over a year. I was originally going to do that class last Lent back in 2020, but a little something called COVID happened and I didn't do it. Uh, so I'm going to do it uh, beginning for Easter season. And we're going to be covering both the traditional Roman Catholic rosary, the Marian rosary, as it's called. We're going to do the Eastern Orthodox prayer rule. And we're also going to do the Anglican rosary and maybe talk about some other prayer beads from other uh, faith traditions, Buddhism, for example, and, and uh, Islam has a, has a form of prayer beads as well. So we're going to kind of go through some of those things. It'll be kind of a fun class. So we're going to be doing that. We're also going to be doing an Episcopal 101 class at some point down the road because I know that there are several people, especially our new members, who are wanting to officially join the Episcopal Church. And so they want to learn a little bit more about the Episcopal Church. And so that is going to be happening as well. At some point, we're going to be having a visitation by our new bishop, Bishop, uh, bishop Tom. And so we'll be uh, hopefully having some confirmations whenever he makes that visit to us. Who knows when that will be? We're not going to push him. We're just happy he's here. So we don't want to, we don't want to put a lot of pressure on him at this point, but maybe a little pressure to say, hey, when you come to do, come, come, we do need some, we do need some confirmations. Uh, let's see, this coming Sunday is Latari Sunday, so it is a Rose Sunday, so we're doing that this coming Sunday. Everybody likes Rose Sunday. That's, we need that little break during uh, Lent. That means we're, about, we're halfway through Lent, and so we're coming down the, the, uh, the low slope for, for Lent, so that will be happening this Sunday as well. Uh, before we even do that, though, on Friday night, of course, is our Stations of the Cross at 6 o'clock. I have been live streaming them, but if you'd like to come... If you'd like to come, that would be good. Why don't you come to the Stations of the Cross if you are able? So uh, we will be doing that uh, on Friday night at 6 o'clock. People have been asking me about Easter. Uh, if you are interested in coming to Easter morning Mass or any of the liturgies during Holy Week, you certainly are welcome to do, it, do that. You do not have to make a reservation for Easter Mass. Uh, we are hoping, though, that uh, if you come, you do follow well, not, we're not hoping, we're actually telling you, you have to uh, follow uh, our 
COVID guidelines for it, of wearing a mask and keeping social distance, even if you've had both vaccines. I'm getting my second vaccine tomorrow. Deacon John has already had his now, I know. Uh, uh, James just had his today, and you had the one shot Johnson & Johnson. So he's done with that. Sandy has had hers, and so we're doing pretty good. And I think a good many people here at St. Stephen's have had both of their vaccine shots. So. You know, we'd really like to see you come back to Mass. We really would like to see people in the pews at some point. Uh, that would be a really good thing, but I understand where people are being cautious and that's a good thing as well. So uh, no pressure on anybody to do any of that. But, Jane, what, yes? Do you want to pitch the flowers? I will in one second, but I do want to pitch before that, uh, please get your vaccine shots if you are able to and, and if you need help getting a vaccine shot just talk to me i can help you whether you're in minnesota or north dakota i can help you do that because we have ways that that can be done and uh if you're waiting for that phone call from the clinic and you're not getting it uh there are other ways you can get the vaccine and i can help you with that so i really am trying to encourage everybody to get the vaccine it's so vitally important for us to be moving on beyond this and I also do want to say that uh, people have been asking, when will things get kind of back to normal? I don't know what the new normal is going to be like. We have no idea how that's going to be. But I think people are asking things about, well, when are we going to be singing like in church? And we're already singing in church, so that's a good thing. And when are we going to be doing coffee hour? I'm shooting in my mind toward September for our Welcome Back Center, our Dedication Sunday. That would be the ideal point but we're not putting that in stone yet. So, uh, you know, and if things are going down, if numbers are going down, maybe over the summer, maybe we'll do some little things in between where we can maybe do a little something and just see how it is. We might have some test moments where we'll, we'll try it out and see what's happening. But we're just playing that very loose and easy at this point because, you know, we gotta, we gotta be cautious and careful. Going back to Easter, yes, Sandy uh, uh, wants to make very clear that if you would like to bring, uh, donate for flowers, have flowers in memory or in honor of somebody, we are doing that right now. We're going to have some beautiful flowers. Do you want to share a little bit about what the plan is for the flowers, Sandy? We're going to do um, a variety, not just lilies. Um, and you can send donations to the church or you could do it through PayPal um, through our website. Just be sure that you designate them for flowers. Yep, for de Easter. designate it for Easter flowers and then also designate if you want it in memory or in honor of someone. And we will make sure that James gets that so they're listed in the bulletin for Easter Sunday. So that will be a beautiful thing as well. So we always love to do that. Last year, uh, was a weird time. We, because we were right in the middle of that beginning, uh, the right in the, the middle of COVID, and it was a really bad time for us. People just didn't feel like doing it. And we did have flowers. Um, uh, somebody donated flowers. Somebody uh, uh, very graciously donated flowers, and I'm happy about that. But it last Easter was probably the worst Easter I've ever had in my entire life. It was, it was not a pleasant Easter because of nobody here, and it, it was COVID. We're going to try to make this a much better Easter. So, you know, flowers, donate for the flowers, and let's make the church look really beautiful. That would be great. Any other announcements? I think that's about it. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself as an offering and sacrifice to God.
the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We live them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right indeed, ever living God, to give you thanks through Jesus Christ, your only Son. You are the source of life and goodness. Through your eternal word, you created all things from the beginning. When we sinned and turned away, you called us back to yourself and gave your Son to share our human nature. His cross has given us strength and freedom to enter by the narrow gate to choose the path of life, and in these 40 days to share his trials. And so this day we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, in the highest. Hosanna in the highest, in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, in the highest. Hosanna in the highest, in the highest. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took a cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Therefore, loving God, recalling your great goodness to us in Christ, we celebrate our redemption with this bread of life and this cup of salvation. Send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ. Grant that we, filled with the Spirit's grace and power, may be renewed for the service of your kingdom. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, and united with all who stand before you on earth and in heaven, we worship you, O God, in songs of everlasting praise. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Jesus, Lamb of God, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, Jesus, Lamb of God, would come down from heaven, 
have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. Jesus, Lamb of God, gentle Prince of Peace, grant us peace. Grant us peace. Grant us peace. Grant us peace. This is the Lamb of God. This is the one who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are we who are called to this supper. And at this time, let us pray for all those who cannot receive Holy Communion at this time. Lord Jesus, be present with those who long to be here and receive your presence in this Holy Eucharist. Come spiritually into their hearts, and let them know your healing, loving, and life-giving presence, and never let them be separated from you. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with spiritual food in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Now send us forth a people forgiven, healed, renewed, that we may proclaim your love to the world and continue in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. Bow down before our God. May God bless you with discomfort, discomfort of easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may live deep within your heart. Amen. May God bless you with anger, anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people, so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. Amen. May God bless you with tears, tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. Amen. Amen. May God bless you with foolishness, enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world, so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
Let us now go forth in the power of the Spirit to love and serve God. Thanks be to God.